Good morning, church. Come on, let's stand together as we worship our God this morning. Listen, Jesus says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, who are weary, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And you know, I know there's a lot of us this morning with daylight savings time who need physical rest. So some of y'all are giving me an extra hallelujah. You know, I hear you. We need it. We, we're really thankful. You know, we spent the last service, we thanked our coffee team. Can we thank our coffee teams this morning? You know, today's the day where they, they're the real MVPs this morning, right? So we're thankful for them. But maybe, you know, your, your rest this morning, your need for rest, your weariness goes beyond the physical. You know, maybe it goes beyond the, the, the lack of sleep that you had last night or the hour that was lost. Maybe you've come in this morning and your soul is tired. Your spirit is heavy. It's full of burden. It's weighed down. Maybe it's the weight of your sin. Maybe it's the weight of someone else's sin sitting on you. Maybe it's shame like we talked about last week. Whatever it is, Jesus has promised that in him we can find rest. That in him we can bring our burdens before them, lay, before him, laying them at the foot of the cross, knowing that he's the one that's faithful to pick them up and carry them on our behalf, and that we don't have to do that anymore. And the way that we can do that, the way that we can bring that, the access that we have to him is found in the sacrifice that he made for us, the way that he made for us, right? In the cross. And so we're gonna sing a song that reflects on just that truth, that God would so love the world that he would give his only son. We know the verse, for whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we celebrate that this morning. We celebrate the sacrifice of our God and we celebrate the great rest that is found in Jesus' name, amen? Can we sing together? Come on. Come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and no more hey. come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy oh taste of his goodness and find what you're looking for come on he satisfies our need and for God so loved the world that he gave us cross. Oh, Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Yes, he is. And for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. He's defeated the grave. And the power of hell forever defeated And now it is well And I'm walking in freedom For God so loved Oh God so loved the world Thank you Jesus oh. Praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise Him, praise God. And praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God. Come 
whoever believes in him will live forever. Do you believe it? Oh, and the power of hell is forever defeated. And now it is well. And I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Amen. Amen. Boy, that is good news for us this morning. And listen, I'm glad to be able to sing it with each of you, with your, your smiling half faces. Glad that you're here. You didn't, let the, you didn't let the daylight savings time hold you back from coming and worshiping our God. And so I'm thankful for that this morning. If you're tuning in online, we're also glad that you're here. Can we, can we welcome our online guests this morning? Hey, we're glad that you're here. So we want to connect with you. You know, and we want to be able to say thanks for worshiping with us. If you're in the room, you can text this number. You can text the word connect there. If you're watching online, go to calvarynow.com slash connect. That lets us say hi and thank you for being here with us. Listen, you know, last week we, I just mentioned we talked about shame. This week, Pastor Will is going to talk to us about, about anger. And um, what an important emotion for us to tackle. I've really liked this, where the smoke is serious. This is what the word of God says. Psalm 145 describing the Lord. It says this in verse 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's great in faithful love. Now just before this, verse 3, remember it says this, the Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. He's holy is what he's saying. He's, a, he's different than us. He's set apart from us, right? He's great. And so often we can confuse that with unapproachable. So often we can confuse that with a God who is like this, who's got his arms crossed and who's waiting for us to mess up. But what, what do we see here in verse 8? It reminds us that the Lord, while he is great, he is gracious and he's compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. It's why we see in James, slow to anger. It's, what, it's the command that James gives us, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, that we would echo the heart of our Father tells us that, that we might respond to God accordingly. And how do we do that? How do we respond to God accordingly? Psalm 103, Psalm of David, it says this, my soul bless the Lord and all that is within me bless his holy name. Follows it up with this, my soul bless the Lord and do not forget all of his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion and he satisfies us with good things. Our youth is renewed like the eagle. Our hearts respond to that faithful love the same way David did with worship. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And so we're gonna sing that. We're gonna respond to God's great love for us this morning, his compassion, his unending love, his mercy. So we sing, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sing with me. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. I worship His holy name. I'll sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. And whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Come on, we bless his name this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. I worship his holy name. Bless you, Jesus. I sing like never before. Oh, my soul. 
You are our chain breaker. You are our refuge. You are the very air that we breathe. And we're so grateful. We're so thankful for the mighty cross where you took all of our weaknesses, all of our sins, all of our shame, and you paid the price for it. And we have all of our hope and trust now in you and all that you're doing. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Be seated.
Well, good morning, Calvary family. It is great to see you here on this uh, glorious March morning, and uh, so glad that you are here. Listen, before we jump in today to our text and our topic for this morning, I want to say to all of our kindergarten through second graders who have pre-registered for Kids Connect, who have this wonderful opportunity to go and worship and learn on their level, our volunteers in the back. Hey, can we thank these kids, our volunteers? So thankful for the families that are a part of our church. And, you know, God has given us two gardens in which to raise the family, the home and the church. And so we want to do our part to partner with families uh, to raise the next generation of Christ followers. And so if you've pre-registered, you can head on back uh, to Kids Connect uh, this morning. Second, let me give you a brief update as we near the completion of our Peace Haven Worship Center and the renovations that are taking place there. It's hard to believe what started the first part of January is this close to being finished. And once more, I want to thank you again uh, for your generosity, which is allowing us to do all of these renovations without incurring any debt. Um, We're able to pay uh, for these, and so we're really, really grateful. And I also want to thank the folks who've worked so hard to see this go from concept to reality, especially Tom Mahaffey, Bob Boone, uh, Bill Robinson, who have tirelessly used their gifts uh, to shepherd this project. And so we owe these men a debt of gratitude. So let me ask, would y'all like to see some photos? So here we go. Let me share with you some images of the renovation that's taking place uh, here. Uh, First, you can quickly see the transformation of the worship center. You can see the work that's been done on the rock wall to make it a beautiful uh, aesthetic. This is from the rock wall looking out. You can see that all the seats are in and everything has been painted nice and bright. I promise these seats aren't like a Delta flight. There's plenty of leg room uh, in there and very comfortable. And you can see just how we've really tried to brighten the room uh, and really make the stained glass really uh, come alive as, as uh, the light shines through it. All of that's been cleaned with new lighting, and so we're really excited about that. And one piece that we've yet to tell you about, because we weren't sure this was going to happen, but we had a very generous donor uh, give us a substantial gift that is allowing us to go ahead and refinish the entire lobby as well. And so now it will all be just one nice, uh, similar uh, look to it. And so we are right on schedule to be ready to open on March the 28th. And so can we give God thanks for that this morning? <clears throat> Listen, let me share with you, I hope this excites you as much as it does me. For those who can't wait for our official opening on Palm Sunday, March the 28th, we are doing an open house on Saturday, March 27th. And so you can go on our website even today um, and you can register for a slot to come by and visit from nine o'clock until one o'clock. So we'll be opening that up for people to walk through in a socially distanced and helpful way. We will be increasing our seating capacity a little bit when we open back up on March the 28th. And so for those those of you who normally worship at Peace Haven, we're excited, you know, about that. Want this to be a uh, time for you to be inviting people in the same way for those who worship with us here at West. We want to see uh, God continue to grow um, in what he's doing um, in our ministries and, and how he is working and moving. So I'm excited about all of that. Well, last week we began a series entitled Where There Is Smoke, uh, looking at three common emotions that often like smoke Uh, reveal to us what's burning kind of in the deep recesses of our hearts. And Pastor Ryan shared an incredible uh, message last week on shame that if you have not had the opportunity to listen to, listen, when you're exercising this week or you're out for a walk, just go onto the archives on our website and listen to it. I promise you, you will be deeply encouraged and challenged uh, as he addressed that uh, incredibly important topic. This morning, however, I want to turn our attention to an emotion that we, like shame, are all very, very familiar with, and that is anger. In fact, I would imagine that for most of us, we could probably look back even over yesterday or earlier this week, and we can find occasions in our lives where we were angry. Someone or something elicited an angry response from us. Maybe it was something you saw on the news. Perhaps something happened at work. Perhaps things got a little tense between you and your spouse or your kids. Or you experienced anger when your favorite sports team lost by 20 in the first round of the ACC tournament. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, anger came up that way. 
Listen, we all experience anger, and we all experience anger often. And here's the thing. When anger in our lives is rightly ordered and rightly focused, it can actually help to bring about tremendous good as injustices are both addressed and restored. However, misguided and wrongly focused anger can be utterly destructive. We see it in relationships that are fractured and destroyed, marriages that are broken, even in extreme circumstances where it's led to incarceration, where we see uh, tremendous physical and emotional abuses. So this morning, my hope is that we would not only better understand anger and its impact on our lives, but we would learn to rightly respond to anger. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And some of you are going, wait a minute, I thought we were done with Ephesians. But we're going to jump off in Ephesians 4, and then we're going to look at a couple of other passages in Exodus 34, as well as James chapter 4 this morning. But this is going to be our jumping off point. And if I could be just... Um, I'm always honest with you. I want to share my heart with you for, for just a moment as we kind of dive into this subject. My prayer is that we would not just walk away this morning with some good information about anger, that we would understand it a little bit more. But my prayer this morning would be that there would actually be life change that takes place. Because I am convinced that some of you right now are dealing with anger and bitterness, and it is fracturing family, it is fracturing relationships, and it's destroying things in your life. And I pray that this morning would be a morning where chains would be broken and bonds would be broken and that the gospel would liberate us and that we would not only see things rightly, but we would respond by faith in a way that brings great glory and honor to God when we see the injustices of the world around us. So that's my prayer for us. So let's look together at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, and we're going to read through the end of verse 32. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, um, as we often pray when we gather here as brothers and sisters in Christ, we believe that this is a sacred moment as we obediently fulfill um, the assembling together as the local body. And Father, I pray now that as we open up your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would bring life change as your word is taught and as we feast upon it. But Lord, I pray that it would not just lead to being puffed up with knowledge, but Father, it would lead to genuine transformation in our lives. For those right now who are gripped with anger, they know it, they, can ex- they feel it in their hearts, there's bitterness, there's disdain. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of freedom. Lord, I pray that as we fix our eyes upon you, Lord, you would break those chains, Lord, and that we would walk in the freedom and in the joy and in the life that you intend for us to. So, Father, I'm asking you now to do immeasurably more than than I can know to ask and think of uh, because you are able to do it. And I'd ask, Lord, that you would get me out of the way and that you would speak. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to accomplish three things with you as we look at this important topic of anger. One is I'd like for us to rightly define anger. I'd like for us all to kind of have a similar foundation that we kind of build upon as we walk through the message this morning. And then secondly, I want us to look at two different types of anger that are found here in Ephesians 4 and try to understand the two different types and how the Bible speaks to those things. And then the last thing I want to do for us this morning is to share with you some practical helps that I think 
if we will embrace, will help us appropriately deal with sinful and unrighteous anger that is uh, evolving in our lives, okay? So those are the three main ideas, the three main headings that we're going to walk through this morning. So let's jump in by defining anger. And as I mentioned, as we consider this text and a couple of others, I think it's important for us just to set a good foundation. And so I want to give you a definition of anger from David Paulison, who is a Christian and biblical counselor. And he says anger is simply this. It is an active stance you take to oppose something you assess to be important and wrong. So anger is an active stance that you take to oppose something you assess to be important and wrong. When we believe that there has been an injustice, an injustice has occurred either against ourselves or others, anger arises up within us. And we see it like in really simple ways, right? If you're cut off in traffic, boom, what are you doing? Man, you're laying on the horn and you're yelling in your car and you're not praising Jesus in those moments. You know, parents get heated on the sidelines of a ball game, right, when they're kids, when you feel like an injustice against, you know, little Johnny, you know, is taking place. The ref is blind. He can't see. You know, he got a red card and he shouldn't. You know, I can tell you one time, it was, I think it was 1997, I had just come back to Calvary and Truett had asked me if I would coach the middle school boys basketball team. I'm like, man, I'm not good at basketball, but I'll do it. We made it all the way to the championship game. And we were getting throttled. And I felt like the refs were not calling a fair game. So I got up and I just started berating the refs. Staff member of Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> Teed up in the church basketball league, right? The ref comes over and is like, hey, son, I'm going to need you to sit down. And I was like, yes, sir. So I sat down and didn't say much the rest of the game. We came back and won that game, though. So it was pretty awesome, right? But you see it. Like anger coming out of you when you sense that there is an injustice that is being done. That's why anger is called the moral emotion. It's the moral emotion because it's always passing judgment. It's always passing judgment, but here's the problem. Sometimes those judgments are right, but sometimes those judgments are wrong. Sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. And this is precisely why Anger can be so dangerous in our lives. And this is why we need to be clear in our understanding of how the Scripture speaks to anger, the types of anger that we see. So when we look at Ephesians 4, 26, we actually see anger described in two different ways. Okay, so look with me at verse 26 where it says, be what, church? Be angry. Be angry. So what that connotes to us is that there is indeed a righteous anger. There is a righteous anger. And I want you to notice that in the original language, the words be angry are a present imperative. And what that means is that it is a continual command. So an imperative is a command. And so what Paul is saying here, he's saying, be angry. I'm commanding you to be angry. In other words, righteous anger is not just permitted, it's actually commanded to us. And there are times, listen, when it would be sinful and wrong for you not to be angry. It'd be a sin for you not to be angry. You would be being disobedient to the command that you're seeing here in the scripture. I shared with you that in the summer of 2019, Julie and I had the opportunity to go to Poland to speak to some IMB leaders who were serving in some of the world's hardest places. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to go to Auschwitz and Birkenau concentration camps where you see the horrors that were done by the Nazis against the Jewish people and many others. You saw the mounds of hair that were shaved from the men and women and children. You saw the glasses and the suitcases and the personal belongings that were piled up. You saw the canisters that held the poisonous gas that killed literally hundreds of thousand people in the gas chambers. When you see those types of things, if you're not angry, then that's not right. That's sinful. We should be angry at that. It should elicit in us a righteous anger that says that is wicked and evil and wrong. When we see injustices that are done against our brothers and sisters of color, and we see injustices in our society, we should stand up and say that is wrong. Because all people are created in the image of God. There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. All 
are created equal in the eyes of God. That's what the scripture is saying to us. When we see the wickedness and evil of abortion and we see that the value of life is not raised, that should elicit in us anger. When we see emotional and spiritual and physical abuses taking place, it ought to elicit in us anger. You see, righteous anger, church family, is rooted, hear this, it's rooted in the nature and character of God, and we are created in his image. So it's rooted in the nature and character of God, and we're created in his image. And so our anger is the direct result of his love and his justice. Because God is loving, because God is just, the appropriate response to injustices is anger. And we see God being angry in the scripture. In fact, hold your place here. Flip back with me to Exodus chapter 34. It's the second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 34, to give you a little context, we're going to see God describe himself to Moses. When he passes by Moses, he puts him in the cleft of the rock in Exodus 34, and he's going to describe himself. Now, a little bit of the context here, Moses has been up on the mountain, he's received the law, he comes down off of the mountain, and he finds the rest of Israel worshiping these golden calves, and he's furious, and God is furious, and God's like, I'm going to judge you, and my judgment upon you is, you're going to go into the promised land, but I am not going to go with you. And Moses is like, listen, God, if you don't go with us, then I don't want to go. You have to go with us because how else will they know that you are our God? How else will they know to fear your name? How else will they know that we are the chosen people? And so God relents. And Moses says, I want to see you. I want to behold you. So he invites him back up on the mountain again, and we see him place Moses in the cleft of the rock. And look with me at Exodus 34, verse 5, where the scripture, well, it'd be good if I turn there talking so much. Verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him being Moses and proclaimed, here's his name, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to what church? Anger, slow to anger. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So I don't want you to miss this. God's anger is rooted in his love and his justice. So think about it this way. How can you really love something? How can you really love something and not be angry when an injustice is committed? Like the five people I love most in this world are my wife and my children, right? When there is an injustice done against them, you know, daddy bear kind of comes out a little bit, right? And you want to protect that. You want to protect them. And so you see that coming. Our righteous anger is rooted in the love and justice of God. And so it seems appropriate. That's why we see in the New Testament, not only does God say, this is my name, but we see it in Jesus, right? Let me give you like three or four different places you can go and read about Jesus's anger. All right, so just write these references down. We're not going to turn there. But in Matthew chapter 21, when Jesus sees the Gentiles are being kept from worship and he overturns the tables in the temple, the anger is appropriate, right? Right? He's saying, there's an injustice being done that are keeping these people from worshiping me and my father's house shall be a house of prayer. So what does he go and do? He flips over the temple. He flips that stuff over. And you never see Jesus coming back saying, you know, I was wrong to do that. I just got a little hot under the collar. No, he was justified in doing that. Think about in Mark chapter three, when Jesus had the opportunity to heal the man with a withered hand. The Pharisees were more concerned with whether or not Jesus would uphold their religious customs and seeing the hardness of their hearts when they saw a person who could be healed, Jesus was angry with them. In Mark chapter 10, when the children were kept from coming to Jesus, Jesus was like, do not keep the children from coming after me. And the scripture says that he was indignant at that. There was an injustice being done. In John chapter 11, when he saw and experienced the effects of sin and brokenness in the world with Lazarus, we know that he was angry at that and wept 
over that. So you cannot deeply love someone and not be angered when injustices are perpetuated against them. It is a righteous anger. Dr. Chapman, in his book, Anger, Handling a Powerful Emotion in a Healthy Way, wrote this. Because God is holy and because God is love, God necessarily experiences anger. All of God's moral laws are based on his holiness and on his love. That is, they are always aligned with what is right, and they are always for the good of his creatures. So anger is his logical response to injustice and unrighteousness. So there is a righteous anger. But I want you to see, secondly, that there is also a sinful anger, a sinful, unrighteous anger. He says, be angry and what? Do not sin. Be angry and do not sin, which connotes to us that if there is an admonition to be angry and not to sin, implies that our anger can easily become sinful. So there is a righteous anger and there is a sinful, unrighteous anger. And here's what I want you to see. When we pull back the curtain and really examine the anger in our lives, we'll discover pretty quickly that sinful, unrighteous anger is much more dominant and much more prominent than a righteous anger. We want, we want to say, man, I'm right in this. I'm right to be angry in that. And there are times you should be. But most of the time, your anger is unrighteous. Most of the time, I would dare argue that your anger is sinful. And so let's try to unpack that for a second. I want to make two observations regarding sinful anger uh, to help us kind of more fully understand it. The first is this. Sinful anger doesn't always appear sinful. Sinful anger doesn't always appear sinful. You say, what what do you mean by that? Sometimes anger comes out in the way you think it would, right? It comes out in aggressive outbursts, getting red in the face, raising your voices, using harsh words, even at times getting physically aggressive. Or it can manifest itself in grumbling or complaining. We can easily identify that. We can easily see that. But there are other times that anger, sinful anger is much harder to diagnose and much harder to see. There are times when our anger seems less obvious. For example, and this was super convicting to me this week. As I was reading and preparing, reading different counselors and st- studying the word. Do y'all ever say things like, I'm not angry, I'm just frustrated. Man, frustration, one biblical counselor said, is just anger in adolescence. It's just anger in adolescence. Think about it. I say it all the time. I'll say it to Julie, I'm not angry, I'm just a little bit frustrated. Well, nothing but anger, you know? I I find myself saying it at church, sometimes with the staff. I'm not angry, I'm just a little bit frustrated that things aren't moving. And when I really begin to peel it back, it's like, no, in the core of it, you're angry. You're angry with that. Sometimes it comes out like, oh, I'm not really angry, I'm just frustrated. Sometimes it just manifests itself in silence. And I can't speak for you, this is how I deal with anger a lot. So when things aren't the way I think they should be, I begin just to pull back and I just begin to get quiet. So I may not outburst, I may not yell, I may not raise my voice, I just kind of get quiet and I pull away. And you begin just to kind of give people a cold shoulder. Right, so sometimes sinful anger doesn't always appear sinful. But I wanna make a second observation uh, related to that and that's this. Sinful anger is rooted in our misguided affections. So remember I told you, righteous anger is rooted in the love and justice of God. Sinful anger is rooted in our misguided affections where we've taken things that are good that God has given them and we've put an inordinate amount of affection on them. We've made them ultimate. And whenever something ultimate in our life is threatened, what happens? The things that are most important to us, that we've put the most affection on, we get angry at those things. And so often our sinful anger is simply the result of misguided affections. So I want you to turn with me to James chapter 4, where I think we can get a better picture of that as we look at it together. James chapter 4 in the New Testament, get to Hebrews and then flip over one more book. James chapter 4, and let's look at verses 1 through 4 for just a moment. James 4, 1 to 4, where the scripture says, What quarrels, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, 
that your passions are at war within you? Do you get what he's saying? He's like, hey, there's these physical problems that are taking place in the context of the body. What is causing that? He's saying, well, what's causing it is right here. He said, is it not that your passions are at war within you? Is it not that you've just got misguided affections? You've taken good things that God has given you and you've turned them into ultimate things. And when that ultimate thing is threatened, now it elicits anger. Now it elicits broken relationships with people who don't value it in the same way that you do. He says you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So what do you do? You fight and you quarrel. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and you do not receive because you, have wrong, you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you see what James is saying? You you want to know what's eliciting anger that's resulting in quarrels and fights? It's the misguided passions, the misguided loves within you. It's because we've taken good and we've turned it into the ultimate. Biblical counselor Ed Welch said it this way. I wanted to share this with you because I think it kind of clues us in a little bit to the types of things that we might, good things that we might make inordinate things, ultimate things for us. We want things like peace, health, love, control, influence, safety, and much, much more. Sinful anger appears when these desires and expectations become more important to us than loving God and our neighbor. So this was so convicting to me, you know, as I thought about it in my own life. I thought about, wow, when I really begin to think that often my anger, when I really evaluate it, is the result of an inordinate, misguided affection. I began to think how frustrated I become if I feel disrespected or underappreciated by my wife or my kids. That frustration is what I experience. How irritable I can be when the plans that I had in my mind don't work out the way that I had hoped they would. And King Will's plans are threatened, right? How quick-tempered I can get whenever I have to wait longer than I think I should, either in traffic or at a restaurant or in a line at the grocery store. I know that y'all never struggle with any of these things, right? But in those moments, I have misguided affections. And when I'm met, it brings out sinful anger. So there's righteous anger, and then there's unrighteous anger. There's anger rooted in the love and justice of God, and then there's anger that is rooted in misguided affections. And so how then should I deal with this misguided, this unhealthy anger in me? And so I want to share with you in my last few minutes together, I want to share with you five five steps for dealing with sinful anger. And these aren't exhaustive, so it's not intended to be like the end all be all. It's just things that I think are really practical that can help us dealing with sinful anger. And the first is this, don't trust your anger. Don't trust it. I shared with you earlier that oftentimes we want initially to say I'm justified in being angry. Don't trust that. Don't trust that initial thought that I'm justified. Rather, spend some time evaluating and ask yourself this question, and it will begin to reveal really the focus of your anger. Ask yourself, am I angry about what God is angry about? So the anger I'm feeling in this moment, is this something that God is also angry about? And if it's not something God is angry about, then it's probably misguided and it's revealing something to be about where my affections really are. So am I angry about what God is angry about? And a second question we can ask is, does my response reveal that I am slow to anger? So What I mean by that is there might be times when you experience some injustice that when you ask the question, is this something God is angry about? The answer to that question is yes. So then the next question from that is, am I responding in the way that God would respond to that? Am I being slow to anger? Am I being patient? Am I being long-suffering? Am I handling it in a way that glorifies and honors God and is similar to how God responds to me when I sin against him? So is my response 
revealing that I am slow to anger. So first, don't trust your anger. Number two, reflect on God's grace towards you. You know, at the end of the passage in Ephesians, the scripture says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as even as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind to one another, be tenderhearted to one another, forgive one another in the same way what as you have been forgiven. You want to work on resolving your anger, then reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. Think about how he went to the cross for you. Think about you at your worst. Stop for a second and think about those times when you look at your life and you're like, man, I totally blew it. You ever had those moments? I blew it with my wife. I blew it with my kids. I raised my voice. I said something I shouldn't have said. I didn't handle this well at work. I didn't handle this well with my family. In those moments, at your worst, I want you to think about this. At your worst, Jesus says to you, I am rich in mercy towards you. And I'm gonna go to the cross and went to the cross for you. And on the cross, I'm not gonna pour on you what you deserve, I'm gonna put it on Jesus. And all the wrath and judgment and anger that God should have had towards us, he put on Christ. And when we think, oh God, that's how you respond to me, how then can I not have a posture where I'm responding to other people in the same way? So I reflect on the gospel's work and God's grace towards me. Number three, repent and confess your anger to God and to others. So it's not just that you doubt your your anger and you don't trust it. And it's not just that you think about the gospel and how God relates to you when you, you know, mess up and how that gives you great grace and it gives you patience. But you need to confess it. You need to repent of it. That's what James is getting at at the end of James chapter 4 in verse 6. He says, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do you see what he's saying? Your sinful anger ought to break you. It ought to lead you to grieve, know that you've grieved the Holy Spirit and it grieves the heart of God and that you humble yourself before him and that your anger makes you sad. God, that I have sinned against you, but claiming the promise here that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all of righteousness, is to know and to believe that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will what? He'll exalt you. He'll raise you up. So you come to him and you confess that and you repent of that and you acknowledge it. God, I see these things in my heart and I trust that you can forgive me and will forgive me according to your promises in Christ Jesus. And then, church family, we confess that not only to the people we've wounded, but also to other people who will hold us accountable. We say this all the time because it's so very important. Things that grow in the dark grow mutant. They don't grow healthy. Nothing grows healthy in the dark. It's only when light is exposed on it. You want to know how to begin to get victory over sinful things like sinful anger? Confess it. Bring it to light. Let people in and let them walk with you. That's why the scripture says confess your sins to one another. That's why we often stand up here and say, listen, if you're dealing with us, come talk to us. We love nothing more than to to walk with you and share with you. This is why on our website we've got a list of counselors that you could go and see like, hey, I need to get this thing exposed. I need to bring it to light so it can no longer have power over me. So that's number three, to repent and confess your anger to God and to others. And then number four is practice restraint. It's to practice restraint. In Ephesians 4, 26, where he says, be angry and do not sin, Paul is actually quoting from Psalm chapter four, verse four, where David says, listen, Psalm 4.4, 4, be angry and do not sin. But then listen to what he says. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and be silent. 
Ray Ortland, one of my favorite writers and pastors, says this. The be angry at the beginning of, four, of Psalm 4-4 is matched by the be silent at the end with the do not sin and ponder in between. He said it's a total package. The right kind of anger is not hot-headed, not impulsive, not screaming rage, but careful and thoughtful. Wise anger is calmly deliberate. Think about the situations in your life that would have gone so differently if you had only practiced restraint and been slow to anger. I, was, uh, I like to read history, and I was reading a book called The American Story, which is written by David Rubenstein, and what he does in is he interviews different biographers who have spent years and years studying famous people in American history. And one of the interviews he does in the books is with D uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who wrote a biography on Abraham Lincoln. And one of the things that was fascinating about that is we all know that at Gettysburg, there was, was towards the end of the war, war and things were really, really violent and things were really difficult. And one of the things that Lincoln had written to his general there, General Meade, he was like, listen, there's one thing that you can't do. You cannot let Lee's army escape. Whatever you do, do not let them escape. Well, what happens, right? Lee's army does indeed escape. And so <clears throat> Goodwin goes on to say that Lee's army did eventually escape, and it became one of the biggest moments of depression for Lincoln when he heard the news. And he wrote a long letter to General Meade in which he said, I'm immeasurably distressed that you didn't do what we asked you to do. Had you been able to get Lee's army, the, the war might have ended in a few months, but now it could go on year after year. Now, can you imagine writing this, and can you imagine being the general getting this from Lincoln? Kearns Goodwin recalls, but he, Lincoln, knew that it would paralyze the general who was in the field, so he did what he often did in those moments. Listen, he wrote what he called a hot letter to General Meade. He would then, he would then put these hot letters aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send them. And when his papers were opened in the 20th century, underneath this letter to Meade was written, never sent and never signed. And he did that dozens of times. Think about how different things would be if we practiced restraint, if we counted to 10, if we walked away, if we wrote a draft and didn't send it. We didn't tweet that. We didn't put that on Facebook. We didn't share that on Instagram. Think about how different things would be. Practice restraint. Be silent. Be still. Ponder in your own bed and practice restraint. And then the last thing, and this is so critical, not only should we practice restraint, but we should remember that God will right every wrong. God will right every wrong. So when dealing with legitimate injustice, that is such an important truth to cling to. Romans 12, 17 says this, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So Calvary family, here's what that means. If a legitimate just injustice has been committed against you, we know that God will deal with that sin, period. And he's going to deal with that sin in one of two ways. He's either going to deal with that sin when that person confesses it, comes to Christ, and God's going to pay for that sin through the finished work of Jesus, just like he did for you. So he'll either pay for it that way in Christ, or he will pay for it when they spend eternity separated from him. But either way, justice is coming, either on the cross or either, either in the consequence of their sin. So you know what that means for you? Now you can hold things with open hands. Now you can forgive in the same way that you have been forgiven. Now you don't have to take vengeance in your own hand. Now you don't have to be bitter anymore and to let that anger fester inside of you because you can release it 
and say, you know what, God? You are going to deal with every single sin. Not one, not one thing will transpire in which you will not judge either on the cross or in eternity separated from them in hell. And that frees us. So when we experience those things, claim that truth, claim that promise, and let God do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Amen? Will you pray with me? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you right now, what anger are you dealing with in this moment? What anger have you felt welling up in your heart, maybe over the last weeks, maybe over the last years, that you need to confess to the Lord and trust that he is going to deal with it? Will you take that and will you just confess that to him and to think in this moment as you confess it, think about your own salvation? then I want to ask you, what is God calling you to do today? Maybe he's leading you to talk to someone, a pastor, a counselor. Maybe it's to talk with someone who's hurt you. Listen, Paul would write, in as much as it's up to you and under your control, live peaceably with all men. So what is God calling you to do There are certainly certain things that are outside of our control and we can't control those things. So we trust God with that. But what is he calling us to do in obedience? And would you by faith today trust and obey? Say, God, I'll, I'll go and do whatever you're calling me to do, believing that your being obedient is right and good and for your glory. God, I pray that you would work in us now break the chains. Let us be a people who are confident in you. Let us be a people who have righteous anger, but passionately seek to kill the sinful anger in our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Come on, let's stand and worship him for his goodness, for his mercy, for his long suffering. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. We sing. Praise the Lord, oh, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, and new every morn. Our sins, they are many, but His mercy is more. Hallelujah. Oh. And what patience would wait as we constantly roam? And what Father so tender is calling us home? Well, He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, oh, His mercy is more, oh, it's stronger than darkness, and new every morn, well, our sins, they are many, but His mercy, come on, oh, praise the Lord.
every morn well, our sins they are many but his mercy is more our sins they are many but his mercy is more our sins they are worthy of our praise this morning. Hey, listen, you know, if we believe that that is true, then that is a message that we cannot neglect to share with the world around us. Amen. So we're going to take a minute, take a seat for just a second. We're going to watch a story of someone who is sharing that message of God's great mercy with the world around us. My name is Ngim Tran, and I have been a pastor for Vietnamese congregation in uh, uh, Winston-Salem at Calvary uh, since 2002. I came to the uh, United States in, in 1999 uh, as an uh, international student. I was born in, in uh, a Christian family, uh, a pastor's family. My parents around me, my grandmom, uh, friends, and teachers, uh, to sow seed to my life. And it took God 17 years to win a hard-headed guy like me. Yeah, I accepted Christ in uh, um, when I was 17. In 2002, I was uh, a member of Vietnamese church in uh, Greensboro, and uh, the pastor just wanted to plan a new church for Vietnamese in, in Winston-Salem. I, I accepted that call without knowing anything about church planting. There are many, many small Vietnamese community all over North Carolina, all over the state, and even in the world. And not many people want to go there uh, to reach out to those people. Those Vietnamese people living in small cities like that still have very strong connections with their relatives in other states and also back in Vietnam. And you can imagine, if they know Christ, they will be missionaries back to Vietnam. You, you can see that, you can imagine how God is working His mighty plan upon Vietnamese people. I'm planning to, to uh, plan a new church for Vietnamese in the uh, East Coast, specifically in, in uh, Wilmington, Jacksonville, and Mohan. We, we're praying that uh, one day God will continue to use us uh, back in Vietnam. Calvary family, I don't know about you, but one of the ways that God really strengthens my faith and really gives me the courage to live on his mission is by hearing the stories and celebrating the stories of people who are living on his mission. And so I hope that your faith has been strengthened like mine has just hearing this short story this morning. And uh, Pastor Tran has been leading our Vietnamese congregation. He's been investing in the life of our church for years and years and years. And now we get to see him sent out on God's mission to Eastern North Carolina to plant churches so that more and more and more people would have the opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus and to trust him for salvation, to know the God who created them, the God who loves them, and the God who wants the very best for them. Our prayer is that they would get that opportunity through the mission and the ministry of Pastor Tran and his family. Pastor Tran and his wife are here with us. Calvary family, will you help me encourage and thank them this morning? Thank you. Pastor Tran is going to be ordained this afternoon at 3 o'clock here at Calvary West, and you're all invited. So if you'd like to join us at 3 o'clock, it's going to be in room 3103, which is directly through those doors. And uh, you can also join us online at 3 o'clock as well, calvarynow.com slash missions. The service will be live streamed. Even if you can't be here today, I want you to know that you've already been a part of their going and us sending them through your generosity with things like the Global Missions Offering. You know, when we talk about your giving being the thing that funds and fuels the mission of the church, this is the stuff that we're talking about. Your giving has gone to support their ministry and their mission. And I want to say thank you uh, from the church and thank you on their behalf as well. If you're giving today, you can do that online at calvarynow.com, or you can do that as you head out. There's an opportunity to do that on the do or at the doors on the way out. Listen, Will read something from Romans 12 that I want to circle back around to. 
In uh, chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There's a lot baked into that phrase, as far as it depends on you. But we talked about confession and repentance, talking to the people that you've wronged and talking to someone who can help you deal with the anger that you have. So if you need help with that conversation, with that as far as it depends on you, I want you to let us know. You can do that through the Connect form on the website. You can do that by looking up our emails, and anybody on staff would be happy to have that conversation with you. And we also have a list of counselors, we'll mention, that's hosted on our website. You can find it there as well. Whatever that is, as far as it depends on you, may God bless you this week as you take that step of obedience and faith and courage to deal with what's really going on in your heart, that you can trust Jesus in the midst of that. This is how Paul closes it out. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So Calvary families, you go back to your family, as you go back to your neighbors, as you go back to your workplaces, may we be people who in our hearts and through our lives are overcoming evil with the good of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Calvary family, you are sent.